maybe I should um, just do the sermon from there. I mean, that's the way the, um, you know, Jesus did it in the Sermon on the Mount. Although I have to admit I like standing. I, I like to be able to move around. It seems for some reason to make it easier <laughs> to speak. Uh, the, the text is still the same text, the one that I read uh, for our reading of the law. And remember, we're just simply seeking to understand the commandment. And uh, now we want to get in, I think primarily, I should say, okay, towards, towards the end, the latter half of the sermon is going to be dealing with the language of the commandment. We do need to understand what it's saying and what it's not saying with regard to the timing Okay, the timing of the Sabbath day, because this, as I'm going to point out from quotes from those that believe in a seventh day Sabbath, uh, is, is a controversial issue. So let me begin, though, because, you know, this is kind of like uh, going through the apologetic seminar where um, we looked at a lot of material, and as we're going week after week, uh, we kind of tend to lose track of where we've been. Uh, so we've already spent two weeks on this, four sermons, basically two hours. Um, I want to just review quickly what we've seen. Uh, let me just make it simple to begin with uh, because we can lose, again, the forest for the trees. The reason why we believe the commandment continues is because it's a part of the Ten Commandments. And Jesus tells us that that continues to be the moral standard today. And that is, in fact, what the blessing of the new covenant is, is the writing of those commandments on our hearts, giving us the power to keep them because the desire to keep them. But again, things get more complicated as more challenges are brought, so we have to look at other things. So we've been looking at more arguments, um, the reasons why we believe it continues, and we've seen so far these things that... We believe it continues, first of all, because God established the Sabbath at the end of the creation week and made it to be a day of rest and blessing and worship for Adam and Eve, and not just for them, but remember the plan was that they were going to have children, the children were going to, you know, they were going to multiply, fill the earth, they were going to subdue the earth, um, the, you know, cultural mandate, and they were going to work and they needed a day of rest and worship, so this day was for all mankind. But God established this day because on that day he rested. And we might want to say, or I think we have to say, God wanted man's work to reflect his. Okay? God worked six days and he rested on the seventh, so man was to work six days and rest on the seventh. We saw that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath. Uh, you know, they, they didn't just continually work and just eat and sleep and work. They worshipped. You know, they, they kept that day holy to the Lord. We saw that they passed it on. To their children, as we see Cain and Abel bringing a, a sacrifice to the Lord at the end of days or the end of the week, that it continued in the godly line from Seth to Jacob, remember, because there were righteous men, counted as righteous. Enoch walked with God. Noah was righteous in the sight of God, and so was Abraham. And this is all before the giving of the law, but God had instituted the Sabbath for worship, and so they must have been keeping that Sabbath, even if it isn't explicitly said. We saw that it was lost to the Israelites during their captivity in Egypt, but immediately when the Lord brought them out, He restored it. Uh, that He showed that it was going to be permanent by, again, writing it on stone tablets, not putting it in the ceremonial law, which was written in a book placed beside the ark, but on the tablets of stone that were placed within the ark because it was continuing moral standard, the breaking of which would require the sacrifice, of course, of our Lord Jesus Christ, pictured by the blood placed on the mercy seat, which is over the commandments themselves. And, of course, it was further shown to be permanent in the Old Testament by Isaiah's prophesying that it would continue into the new covenant when, again, eunuchs and foreigners would be brought into the assembly of the Lord, those who kept the Sabbath would be blessed. We saw from the New Testament that Jesus said that, the, that it would continue, that the entire moral law would continue as long as the present heavens and earth continue. I mean, as long as they endure, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter is going to pass away until everything that God has planned for the heavens and earth uh, has actually reached its completion. We saw that Jesus kept the Sabbath. He did it because he was obeying his Father. He wanted to honor him. He wanted to provide a perfect righteousness for his people, and that was a part of that perfect righteousness. He 
kept it to give us an example to follow. And He also kept it to give us the power to do the same thing. We saw that far from abolishing the Sabbath, he, Jesus declared Himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He corrected the Jewish misunderstandings about the Sabbath. And He directed His disciples that when they went out to the nations, that they were to teach them these same things. Everything that I have taught you, I want you to teach them. He also said to His disciples, by way of prophetic word, that they would be continuing to keep the Sabbath many years after his work was finished and he had been raised from the dead and ascended into heaven when he told them that they should pray that when 70 A.D. comes, that that day would not, the day of their running or fleeing from Jerusalem, would not take place on the Sabbath day, showing us again the Sabbath continues. And we saw that the author to the Hebrews also affirmed that rather than canceling out the Sabbath, which is what many people, many evangelical Christians believe that Jesus' work actually did, that His work actually establishes the continuance of the Sabbath and really the new day of the Sabbath at the same time, which is something we're going to look at, not this morning, but this evening. His work is the basis for that continuing Sabbath. And again, Hebrews 4 verses 9 through 10 which, again, we'll make reference to this evening. But we also looked at four objections. The first objection was we don't need to keep the Ten Commandments because they were only for the Old Covenant people of God. But we know that isn't true because we have already saw Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that the entire law continues for God's people now. And that there is also a blessing upon those who keep those commandments and teach others to do the same and an implied curse upon those who would nullify the least of these commandments and so teach others to do the same. Jesus was saying that we will be blessed if we keep the commandments and encourage others to do the same, and that includes the Sabbath. Secondly, there are those who believe the Sabbath continues, but we no longer need to keep the fourth commandment because of the ten, it alone is not a moral commandment. Now, we know that can't be true because Jesus already said, you know, told us that they all continue, okay, so that is an argument against that, that all of them are written on our hearts, that, that we have the power to keep them all, and because the fourth commandment is a moral commandment. I mean, let's not forget, we are commanded to meet together to worship the Lord. To do that, we have to have time. And that time needs to be on a day that is in common for all of us. Otherwise, we won't be able to follow through with what God calls us to do. But that's exactly what God requires through this commandment, what He provides. He provides the day. He provides the time that is common to all of us so that we can follow through with our obligation, our moral duty to worship Him. I don't see how we can get away from the fact that this commandment is moral. Now, third, we also looked at the two main objections that, first of all, since Paul tells us that we should not allow anyone to act as our judge regarding the Sabbath, that obviously the Sabbath day cannot continue. But we saw that the word that Paul uses for Sabbath in this passage is in Colossians is in the plural, Sabbaths, and that there are other Sabbaths. There are Sabbaths that are connected to the ceremonial law. Virtually every feast was called a Sabbath. Now, in the New Covenant, those Sabbaths may or may not be kept. It's a matter of Christian liberty. And that's why no one should act as our judge regarding those days. But that doesn't include the weekly Sabbath. And if we want to argue that the Sabbath is ceremonial because Paul includes it in that passage, we do need to remember that the weekly Sabbath was established long before the ceremonial Sabbath. It was established at the very beginning of creation, and it was written on tablets of stone. It is not in the ceremonial law. It's before the ceremonial law. It's separated from the ceremonial law because it is the weekly Sabbath and not the ceremonial Sabbath. And then finally, the argument is the Sabbath can't continue because Paul also tells us in, in Romans that we have liberty to regard one day above another or to consider every day the same. It, it's a matter of what we choose to do. 
Well, the problem with that is uh, God actually does single out a particular day in the Bible called the Lord's Day, and it's the day that John was in the Spirit. It's the day that belongs to Jesus. It's, it's believed, of course, to be the day that Jesus rose from the dead and entered into his rest. That day is singled out. If God singles out a day, we can't just say, well, I'm not going to regard that day. I'm just going to count every day the same. No, that, that's not what Paul is saying He's again speaking about the ceremonial feast days that we have the liberty either to observe or not observe. We can have one day above another. Or we can consider them all the same because those, again, that's a matter of Christian liberty in the new covenant. So the, the argument for the past two weeks has been essentially this, that God shows us in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that the Sabbath that he established at creation was meant to be the practice of mankind from the very beginning and to continue to the end of the heavens and the earth. When we enter into the eternal Sabbath, then the weekly Sabbath will cease. Okay? When the reality comes, that shadow will be done away with. Now, the next question we want to consider is, is this. On what day should we observe the Sabbath? You know? because that also is controversial, as we saw when we started this series. I noted that there are those among, I should say, those among those who believe the Sabbath continues, that there are some who insist that it must be observed on the seventh day of the week, okay, seventh day of the week. Two such obvious groups are the Seventh-day Baptists, which we don't really hear a whole lot about. I'm not very familiar with them. I think essentially they're Evangelicals, uh, probably not Calvinistic, that you know, believe that we should worship on Saturday rather than Sunday. And of course, the Seventh-day Adventists who are you know, known for this. Now, why do they believe this? Well, I think the most obvious answer is because that, they believe that's what the commandment says. And that's what we're going to look at. But let me, let me give you their argument. It's a popular argument from their official website slightly condensed, but very understandable, okay? So this is what they say. In most every country of the world, most Christian people go to church on Sunday, believing that Sunday, not Saturday, is the Sabbath day, or at least the day now recognized as special in the New Testament. So some think it's the Sabbath, some think it's the Lord's day, and we should at least worship on that day. We humbly suggest, though, but this is another case of the majority getting it wrong. Now, another case, because I eliminated the illustration at the beginning, which is where, hey, you know, Galileo was trying to tell the world that, um, you know, this, the earth rotates around the sun, but people wouldn't listen to him. And the majority of people thought he was wrong, but he was actually right. So, okay, we're like Galileo. We, we see the truth, but most people are like the rest of the world who still are, are looking at it incorrectly, okay? So, okay, the New Testament never talks about the Sabbath as anything other than Saturday, the seventh day, as seen in the fourth commandment. Okay, this is their main argument. It was the day that Jesus always kept too. Paul also had the same custom, quote, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. The misconception about the Sabbath being changed from the seventh day to the first or even being abolished often comes from the battles Jesus had with the religious leaders over the Sabbath. But if one reads every account of those incidents, what is clear is that the issue of which day to keep never came up. Instead, in every case, the controversy was over how to keep the seventh day Sabbath, Saturday, it was never over whether it should still be kept or whether a new day, Sunday, should replace it. Okay? Granted, okay? Indeed, why would he have bothered to teach the people what was proper or improper to do on the seventh day Sabbath if his intention were to change it to another day or to abolish it altogether? The only thing Jesus wanted to change about the seventh day was how it was kept. Nothing he said or did indicated that the day itself was to be replaced by another day. Jesus, both by example and by command, showed that the seventh day, Saturday, is still the Sabbath. It's a truth as obvious as the earth moving around the sun. I think you get the reference there. No, even more obvious, we think. Okay. 
So it's, it's clear where they stand. By the way, we would agree with some of the things they had to say. Uh, we would certainly uh, want to um, close ranks on the fact that the Sabbath continues, but we wouldn't want to close ranks on the particular day. Now again, we're going to look at the case for the first day of the week, the Lord's Day being the Christian Sabbath or the day the Lord wants us to observe. Uh, and I'm going to begin by looking at the commandment, but I thought maybe we could just kind of preview this a little bit by answering these arguments briefly, okay? Now, first, the Adventists simply assume that they are right, okay? They, they beg the question when they say that the New Testament never talks, they didn't say just Jesus, but they said the New Testament never talks about the Sabbath day as any other day than Saturday, uh, I'm going to take, you know, exception to that. I'm going to argue against that. Now, we would agree that maybe the New Testament doesn't explicitly say that that day has been changed. But here I'm going to lean on Jonathan Edwards. As he would point out, it doesn't have to say it explicitly. All it has to do is show us. Okay? The Lord has different ways of showing us the truth. And it isn't always by telling us directly. Now, let me... Um, let me give you some examples. Sometimes the Lord speaks very plainly, puts, puts, puts it without, you know, outside, of, outside of question, outside of doubt. He tells us in 2 Timothy 3.16, Scripture is His Word, His very breath. Okay, I realize people debate that, but you know, as far as whether that's true. But no one who believes the Scriptures to be the Word of God doubts that. You know, because God says it, that's all that's needed. And it says, he says it quite plainly. In Deuteronomy 6.4, God says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Okay, the Bible says there is one God. It puts it outside of question. In Acts 16.31, you know, the, I think with regard to the Philippian jailer, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Now, you think that would settle every question, Right? Sadly, it doesn't, even among people who believe the Bible. But that's very straightforward, very simple. So sometimes the Lord speaks very plainly, but sometimes He doesn't. Sometimes He takes bits of the truth and He scatters it throughout the Scriptures, and we need to gather those pieces together and put them, put them together almost like a puzzle, right? Uh, for instance, you know, if we wanted to prove the Trinity, you know, is there a verse, with the exception of the King James Bible, uh, which I don't know if your version contains that one passage in 1 John 5 that talks about the three who bear witness in heaven. But in most of our Bibles, that passage doesn't occur. We don't point to one passage of Scripture to prove it. However, would any of us here argue the Bible does not teach the doctrine of the Trinity? It is scattered throughout the Scriptures. When we gather it all together, we see that's what it teaches. The same thing is true with regard to the personality and deity of the Holy Spirit. You know, doesn't say it in so, in so many words, but shows us that He is a person, shows us He is divine. The inerrancy of Scripture, or here, here's a favorite, the weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper. You know, does it, does it say? I, we, we had a, a ruling elder years ago who loved to say, the Bible doesn't tell us how often we need to celebrate the table. We can do it as often or, you know, or as few times as we want. Uh, why would you want to? Why would you want to say that? You know, uh, the Bible does in fact show us that the people of God, when they met together for worship, celebrated the breaking of the bread, which is simply a part for the whole. They celebrated the Lord's Supper every time they got together, which is why we do it. But he was right; it's not explicit. You have to gather that information together to see what the Bible teaches as a whole. Now, the, facts, the fact that these truths aren't as explicit is one of the reasons why there's been so much debate on, on some of these things in, in the history of the church and even between churches is because, again, the Bible isn't always as explicit as we might like it to be. But the point is this. It doesn't matter how God reveals His truth. What matters is that He reveals it in a way that we can see it and know that it is His will. Now, he may not have told us plainly that the day has changed, but he has told us that it has. Um, and we're going to look at that, okay? Now, with regard to their other arguments, we agree. Jesus kept the Sabbath on Saturday. He did. 
But that's because the day hadn't been changed yet. That was the day that was commanded by his father. We agree that Paul went to the synagogue on the seventh day, on the Jewish Sabbath, but he didn't go there to worship. He went there to evangelize the Jews because that's where they were gathered together. That's where they were, you know, observing the Sabbath. Why not take advantage of that opportunity, especially if you happen to be a Jew and a Jewish rabbi? Paul himself actually observed the first day of the week as a day of rest and worship, which we're going to look at more this evening. We agree that when Jesus was debating the religious leaders, it wasn't over the abolishment of the Sabbath, it wasn't over changing the day, that was not the issue, but over how the Sabbath was to be observed. Okay, we agree with the Seventh-day Adventists, but again, the day or the change of the day had not yet taken place. And yes, Jesus did teach the Jews and uh, the disciples what was appropriate to do on that day, even though he was planning on changing the day. I don't know if the writer of that article even noticed, but you know, what difference does it make what day you observe it on as far as what you're supposed to do on that day? Okay? That doesn't make any difference. So Jesus could teach them what to do on the Saturday Sabbath, and when he changes it to Sunday, then you just transfer what you do on the Sabbath to that day. That's the change of day really should have no bearing on how it is to be observed. Okay, so this, this is their argument. These are the um, perhaps quick refutations against it. But let's now consider their main argument, which is a good place to begin. You know, our, our looking at the change of the day. Their main argument is this that the fourth commandment requires a Saturday Sabbath, requires Saturday Sabbath. I don't know if you noticed the number of times in that article. They didn't just say Sabbath. They said Saturday Sabbath. They said seventh day, Saturday Sabbath, because they want us to get the fact they believe the commandment itself requires a Saturday Sabbath. Now, this is what the commandment says, okay? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now, okay, Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Baptists, a good number of evangelicals, maybe we ourselves have, have uh, from time to time, certainly a dear brother, you know, that... I, that, you know, I've known for a long time, and just, you know, he is a, a very sincere Christian man. He believes this commandment is also designating Saturday, okay? That it designates a particular day of the week that we are to observe. And as I've said, maybe we've read this commandment many times and look at it in the same way as well. But I want you to notice, first of all, that that is not what the commandment actually says. Now, God doesn't say this. The first six days of the week you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day of the week is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. He doesn't say that. What he says is six days you shall labor, but the seventh is a Sabbath. Notice six days, seventh. Not six days of the week. Seventh day of the week. But six days you shall work, you shall labor. The seventh day you shall rest. He isn't necessarily correlating, not that he never did, but he's not necessarily in the commandment itself. And again, think of the wisdom of God, if, especially if he was intending on changing the day at some point. He isn't necessarily correlating the six days of work with any particular days of the week. And the same is true of the seventh day. Okay? It's not necessarily the seventh day of the week. It is the seventh day in a sequence of seven days where you work six days and you rest on the seventh day. In other words, God could have said, okay, I want you to rest on Wednesday. Wednesday is going to be your Sabbath. Then according to this commandment, we would work Thursday through Tuesday and then we would rest on Wednesday. And in, in so doing, we would be keeping the language of the fourth commandment. I want you to see that Nothing has changed. Work six days, rest on the seventh. Well, the day I want you to rest is Wednesday, so work Thursday through Tuesday. Rest on Wednesday. It still fits the language of the commandment. So 
I hope that we can see that the commandment is telling us that after working for six days, we are to rest one day, okay? And I want us to see that if we want to know where to begin and end, if we want to know which day that we are to observe as a Sabbath day, it has to come from outside of the command because the command itself does not designate a day. It only designates a sequence, okay? That, that's, okay, that, hopefully that's something we see. Now, when God first established the Sabbath, He did correlate it with the days of the week, okay? We do believe that. Adam and Eve, we believe, work the fir first six days of the week as God did on the six days of His creation and rested on the seventh day, the, the day that God blessed and sanctified because that was the pattern God gave them, okay? They didn't have that commandment. All they had was the pattern. And so that was the pattern God gave them. That's what they did. But now we should ask the question, is the same thing true with regard to the day that God established as the Sabbath when He brought the Jews out of Egypt? Okay? Remember that they hadn't traveled very far before God gave them a day of rest. Maybe He made them you know, travel for six days and then gave them that uh, other day or that seventh day to rest on the Sabbath. Uh, we need to assume, I believe, uh, and I think very, very clearly so, that Pharaoh did not allow them to keep any kind of a Sabbath while they were slaves in Egypt. He didn't give them a day off. I mean, especially if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, you know that that's the case, although we don't, uh, we don't base what we believe on that movie. But they're reflecting, I think, what they also assume to be true with regard to this enslavement that God did not get, or excuse me, Pharaoh did not give them time off. And when God brought them out of Egypt, they didn't just say, wait a minute, you know, we need to rest this day before we go any further. God had to show them what day they were to keep. And you know, it's possible that the day He showed them to keep as a Sabbath may have even correlated with the recent act of redemption. Okay, God redeemed them and brought them out and then gives them a day to celebrate. But listen to what we read in Ezekiel 20, verses 10 through 12. The Lord speaking through Ezekiel, He says, So I took them out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and informed them of my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Jonathan Edwards believed that here's clear um, indication that Pharaoh did not let them keep the Sabbath and they had lost basically that Sabbath day and so God again gives it uh, to them. You know, another interesting thing to, to realize is this, that if you had no background, let's say, uh, and no uh, predisposition to believe that, you know, the, um, that you should maybe work the, uh, the first six days of the week and rest on the seventh day of the week, and you had no background in Christianity, if somebody were to give you the, the fourth commandment and say, figure out which day you're supposed to observe as a Sabbath, that you wouldn't be able to deduce it from the language of that commandment itself because, again, it doesn't designate a day. It only designates a frequency. Okay, work six days, rest on the seventh, and then it tells you what to do on that seventh day. Keep it holy. Jonathan Edwards writes this, the words of the fourth command may oblige the church under different dispensations to observe different appointed seventh days as well as the fifth commandment may oblige different persons to honor different fathers and mothers. So this is the first point I wanted us to see. God can change the day of the week without changing the commandment. Okay? Because again, the commandment doesn't speak about a particular day. The seventh day is the seventh day of a sequence, not necessarily the seventh day of the week. Okay, we have to be able to distinguish those two things. The word Sabbath simply means rest. It doesn't mean Saturday. Some people think the word Sabbath actually means Saturday, and so we're, we're bound to observe it on Saturday because that's the meaning of the word, but the word doesn't mean Saturday. God has to show us from outside of the commandment itself where the sequence begins 
and on what day that it ends. Now, this evening, we're going to look at the indications that God gives that the day that we should rest and worship is the first day of the week. Not surprisingly, okay, I've already told you that's what we're going to look at. But the reason why, you know, Edwards, why, um, you know, the Christians, why the church throughout the, uh, the, the many uh, eras that we've been examining in church history, ancient church, medieval church, uh, and of course, Reformation church, modern church, the reason why the church has observed the first day of the week is because they believe that there is another work of creation that is being commemorated, okay? Not the work of the old creation any longer because that was destroyed by sin, but rather the work of the new creation that was completed when Jesus entered into his rest, which is on the first day of the week, okay? Now, that's the main argument, and there are other auxiliary arguments. But, of course, that's okay, because the commandment itself is not designating a per particular day. Well, let's, let's uh, stop here, and we'll pick it up again this evening. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's, um, let's thank the Lord that He has given to us, again, a Sabbath. It is meant for our good. It's something that we should love and desire. But uh, we do need to, again, think about whether this is a commandment, because if it's not an optional thing, if we don't keep it, it's going to, you know, it's going to have uh, some consequences that the Lord may work together for good, you know, in the end, right? Um, if we continue to break His Sabbath, we, sh we should be keeping it. He's not going to throw us out of the family, right? But He is going to discipline us, and we're also going to be spiritually weak. But when he disciplines us, we will come out stronger in the end. But I'm arguing if we recognize it as a commandment and do it, then we can be strengthened now, and we don't have to go through that discipline. <laughs> okay? So anyway, let, let's think about that because that is a part of what we, um, what we need to deal with in our own hearts as we come to the table. If we realize that you know, we haven't been keeping the commandment as we should, we do need to repent of that before we participate in the table. We have to deal with all of our sins, not just this one. So let's, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to prepare us to, to come to the table and to celebrate, of course, uh, our Lord's death on our behalf to pay for all of our sins against Him. Let's pray.